Hi everyone, it's Steve Swinburne, and hope you're all doing well. Um, are you supporting your local independent bookstores? Here's Parallels Books right here in Vermont. In southern Vermont, we have North Shore Bookstores. A lot of these places are great places to shop, and they're doing a curbside pickup, and you could order on um, and they'll just bring out your books, and it's still a great thing to do. So keep those independent bookstores going. Um, Nonfiction Thursday. I got a selection of things right here, a wonderful series I want to talk a little bit about called the Scientist in the Field series for a little bit older readers. And I have three books in that series. My first book, and I was grateful that I was one of the first authors on this great list of books, Once a Wolf, The Wood Scientist, and what I'm going to talk to you today is The Sea Turtle Scientist. Um, <clears throat> we had a little bit of a sea turtle book. The other day, Turtle Tide, that was my first sea turtle book. Then we did a sea turtle song yesterday called One in a Thousand. You can check that out. Um, and today, this is a great, these are great books because what they do, they they expose, they, they bring the life of the scientist to life. And it's such a great series of books. And I want you to be thinking, friends, what kind of scientist that you would want to be? I mean, for instance, would you want to be a spider scientist? Could you be a whale scientist? How about, my friend did a book called, Lawyer Griffin Burns did a wonderful book called Tracking Trash. Wonderful book about trash in the ocean. Um, wildlife detectives. So many wonderful books in this series. So I, inv I invite you to check it out and think about it as I talk a little bit about this sea turtle scientist. But what kind of scientist you would want to be? Would you want to study the stars? Would you want to study dinosaur bones? There are places that we need more scientists. So think about that. Uh, let, me, let me start it out with a little reading. This is chapter one. Uh, scoot over here a little bit. And this is how the book begins. And I want you to be thinking about, could Steve have written this book in my home office in Vermont? Sure. Would it have been the same? I ask you to think about that. What, what's the value of me going, of, of authors going to places to dig deep into research? What do you think about, what, what do you get from that? First chapter, one in a thousand. One egg out of a thousand will produce an adult sea turtle, so says Dr. Kimberly Stewart, as she gently places the leatherback hatchling, not much larger than a matchbox car, onto the black fleck sand. Its front flippers begin to beat, heaving the tiny turtle toward the sea and stippling the face of the sand with miniature tracks. This could be the one in a thousand. There's Kimberly releasing. This is what, these books have wonderful photographs, so I'm gonna be sharing some of these photographs with you. We are in St. Kitts, a paddle-shaped island, island and the larger of the two islands that comprise the Caribbean nation of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. St. Kitts is about 23 miles long and six miles across at its widest point. Born in Statesboro, Georgia, there's a close-up right there, in 1976, Kimberly grew up surrounded by animals on a small farm. Do you guys like animals? Anybody out there like animals? Maybe you could be an animal scientist. When she was four years old, her grandma got Kimberly her first cat from a swap buy and sale, a local call-in radio show on which listeners swap things. Kimberly's father and grandmother encouraged her to have pets and put her in charge of their goats, horses, cows, and pigs. I loved everything related to animals, Kimberly says. I declared my major in elementary school. I knew I was going to be a vet. Later, as a biology student in college working on a beach in Georgia, she had the opportunity to release a baby loggerhead sea turtle. While watching that hatchling scramble to the ocean, says Kimberly, I contemplated the many dangers it would face and what seemed like an insurmountable odds to overcome. I began to realize my passion for sea turtles and my, my desire to help. So think about what drives a scientist to do the work that they do. We're going to go to chapter two. Meet, let's see if we can get in there. Meet the leatherback sea turtle. Wow, here we go. It is closing in on midnight. 
In late May, and everyone has walked a half mile of beach along the noisy Caribbean surf, searching for tracks. Kimberly is accompanied by two of her graduate students. Three local Katishians and two American guests fill out our turtle party. Suddenly, a dark swath of disturbed sand emerges out of the surf line, running straight up to the dunes. Kimberly trains a beam from her red headlamp. Headlamp, it's a nesting leatherback. The 800-pound leatherback sea turtle crawls to the soft sand of the upper beach. She shimmers as the last of the seawater runs off her huge frame. Facing away from the sea, the female leatherback uses her three-foot-long front flippers to throw sand. Her strokes are powerful. As she pushes and hurls sand, her body, seven feet long, slowly rotates and settles into a wide body pit. When the body cavity is dug, her rear flippers been, begin to excavate a nest cavity. The body cavity, or body pit, is a depression the female makes before she digs the two feet deep nest cavity or hole. She does everything by feel. She works one flipper at a time, reaching behind her, scooping out the sand and flicking it to the side. Leatherback rear flippers are the size of a baseball glove. Think about a baseball glove, how big that is, and it scoops that sand out. Imagine digging a hole with a baseball glove. Not easy. Her flippers are a multi-tool. Her flippers are a multi-tool, though. They dig, scoop, pat, fling, and tamp down the sand. This area receives a very high tide in July, says Kimberly, scanning the dark beach. We've got to relocate, relocate her eggs. Kimberly knows that sea turtle eggs laid in May will need to incubate for 60 days. So July's high tides could wash away this nest, but the leatherback still has work to do before she actually lays her eggs. She falls into a steady rhythm. The right flipper digs, scoops, flings, tamps. The left flipper digs, scoops, flings, tamps, repeat. When her flippers have dug a hole about 28 inches deep, they begin to widen the bottom, making a vase-like nest. So it's out and then around. Once her flippers have reached as far as they can go, the female leatherback stops digging. She pauses and rests one flipper on a pile of sand. She uses the other to shield the nest cavity, like a curtain screening a stage, protecting the nest from the view of predators. Quick! She's about to drop eggs. Someone, someone count. Someone get a bag. The urgent commands come from Kimberly. The mother turtle is moving fast now that her hole is dug. Wet, gleaming white eggs the size of billiard balls fall into the sandy nest before a bag can be set beneath her. We hear deep reptilian breaths. So the mother sea turtle is nesting and she will spend about two hours laying eggs, creating a nest, laying eggs, and finally covering up those eggs. That's the important part. Can you think about why she wants to cover up those eggs? She wants to disguise her nest site. There's so many predators on the beach, like rats and dogs and mongoose, that she wants to cover up those eggs and keep them safe. Okay, now we're at the part of the story, chapter five, called The Journey of the Hatchlings. I'll read a little of this to you. Alligator and crocodile moms make the best parents in the reptile world. They will guard a nest once their babies are born, actually helping their young out of the eggs. Sea turtles, on the other hand, are barely present when it comes to parental care. The father, leatherbacks after mating, vanishes. The mother offers what care she can, but of necessity, that care is limited to protecting her developing embryos by encasing them in a soft shell drawn from the precious calcium in her own bones, carefully selecting a nest site safe from the dangerous waves of the sea, burying her eggs deep in the sand, and camouflaging them to hide them from hungry predators. A clutch of sea turtle eggs laid in the sand. Left in the sand is a package of protein that few predators can ignore. The turtle nest is most at risk during egg laying and hatching. 
dogs and wild hogs can come up behind an egg-laying female sea turtle and devour her eggs on the spot. Other predators such as vultures, mongoose, rats, raccoons, cats, crabs, and of course people will also consume turtle eggs. If the turtle nest escapes detection from predators, the young may be safe until it is time to leave the nest. The hatchlings have a caruncle, point your nose and say egg tooth, uh, at the tip of their beak. This sharp bony tip will help them slice through the eggshell. The caruncle is temporary and disappears a short time after hatching. Once the hatchling has ripped a hole in the shell, the amniotic fluids that surrounded the baby turtle drain away. How does a three and a half inch leatherback hatchling break free of its shell and dig through more than two feet of hard packed sand to the surface with a little help from its friends? So they work together to get out of that nest and once as a team they get to the top, they are on their own. They have got to make it down to the ocean and they've got to get there fast. And they are off, off and swimming. And oftentimes they do not return to the, to the beach. If, if they're a male, they don't come back at all. If they're a female, they may not come back for another 15, 20, 30 years. They wander the oceans. The, well, the waters of the oceans, and then they will return to that beach or a nearby beach. Pretty remarkable story. There's so much we still need to learn about this incredible creature. That's why I love these books, these nonfiction books that open up these mysteries. Some are solved, some are not, and we need young scientists. Hope that you might consider being a scientist, uh, any kind of a scientist that we need to help animals and other things that we can learn about in the universe, our, our amazing planet. So why do you think I would want to go to a place like St. Kitts and go to a place like Yellowstone when I'm writing these books about these animals? Why can't I just stay in this office in Vermont? I'll tell you why. I think you might know too. This is where you get the really great verbs, nouns, dialogue, and digging deep for the story and that great research that will bring the story to life. And that's what I want to do with these books. And that's what these wonderful scientists in the field books are all about, bringing the story to you. So think about what you might want to do for this book. Maybe you could write your own story, go out and study an animal that you might have in your backyard that you've been thinking about. Uh, could you draw an illustration of hatchlings running down to the sea? So I'll leave you with that today. And I hope you have a great day and take care. Let's zoom in on this as we leave.